Chapter Twenty Two of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by the Story Girl. Chapter Twenty Two Sermons and Wood Boxes. On the afternoon that Pollyanna told John Pendleton of Jimmy Bean, the Reverend Paul Ford climbed the hill and entered the Pendleton woods hoping that the hushed beauty of God's out-of-doors would still the tumult that his children of men had wrought. The Reverend Paul Ford was sick at heart. Month by month, for a year past, conditions in the parish under him had been growing worse and worse, until it seemed that now, turn which way he would, he encountered only wrangling, backbiting, scandal, and jealousy. He had argued, pleaded, rebuked, and ignored by turns. And always and through all he had prayed, earnestly, hopefully. But today, miserably, he was forced to own that matters were no better, but rather worse. Two of his deacons were at sword's points over a silly something that only endless brooding had made of any account. Three of his most energetic women workers had withdrawn from the Ladies' Aid Society because a tiny spark of gossip had been fanned by wagging tongues into a devouring flame of scandal. The choir had split over the amount of solo work given to a fancidly preferred singer. Even the Christian Endeavor Society was in a ferment of unrest owing to open criticism of two of its officers. As to the Sunday school, it had been the resignation of its superintendent and two of its teachers that had been the last straw, and that had sent the harassed minister to the quiet woods for prayer and meditation. Under the green arch of the trees, the Reverend Paul Ford faced the thing squarely. To his mind, the crisis had come. Something must be done, and done at once. The entire work of the church was at a standstill. The Sunday services, the weekday prayer meeting, the missionary teas, even the suppers and socials were becoming less and less well attended. True, a few conscientious workers were still left, but they pulled at cross purposes usually, and always they showed themselves to be acutely aware of the critical eyes all about them, and of the tongues that had nothing to do but to talk about what the eyes saw. And because of all this, the Reverend Paul Ford understood very well that he, God's minister, the church, the town, and even Christianity itself was suffering and must suffer still more unless... Clearly something must be done, and done at once. But what? Slowly the minister took from his pocket the notes he had made for his next Sunday sermon. Frowningly he looked at them. His mouth settled into stern lines, as aloud, very impressively, he read the verses on which he had determined to speak. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye, these ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. It was a bitter denunciation. In the green aisles of the woods, 
The minister's deep voice rang out with scathing effect. Even the birds and squirrels seemed hushed into awed silence. It brought to the minister a vivid realization of how those words would sound the next Sunday when he should utter them before his people in the sacred hush of the church. His people. They were his people. Could he do it? Dare he do it? Dare he not do it? It was a fearful denunciation, even without the words that would follow, his own words. He had prayed and prayed. He had pleaded earnestly for help, for guidance. He longed, oh, how earnestly he longed, to take now in this crisis the right step. But was this the right step? Slowly the minister folded the papers and thrust them back into his pocket. Then, with a sigh that was almost a moan, he flung himself down at the foot of a tree and covered his face with his hands. It was there that Pollyanna, on her way home from the Pendleton house, found him. With a little cry, she ran forward. Oh, oh, Mr. Ford, you you haven't broken your leg or, or anything, have you? She gasped. The minister dropped his hands and looked up quickly. He tried to smile. No, dear. No, indeed. I'm just resting. Oh, sighed Pollyanna, falling back a little. That's all right, then. You see, Mr. Pendleton had broken his leg when I found him, but he was lying down, though, and you were sitting up. Yes, I am sitting up, and I haven't broken anything that doctors can mend. The last words were very low, but Pollyanna heard them. A swift change crossed her face. Her eyes glowed with tender sympathy. I know what you mean. Something plagues you. Father used to feel like that, lots of times. I reckon ministers do, most generally. You see, there's such a lot depends on them somehow. The Reverend Paul Ford turned a little wonderingly. Was your father a minister, Pollyanna? Yes, sir. Didn't you know? I supposed everybody knew that. He married Aunt Polly's sister, and she was my mother. Oh, I understand. But you see, I, I haven't been here many years, so I don't know all the family histories. Yes, sir. I mean, no, sir, smiled Pollyanna. There was a long pause. The minister, still sitting at the foot of the tree, appeared to have forgotten Pollyanna's presence. He had pulled some papers from his pocket and unfolded them, but he was not looking at them. He was gazing instead at a leaf on the ground a little distance away, and it was not even a pretty leaf. It was brown and dead. Pollyanna, looking at him, felt vaguely sorry for him. It, it's a nice day she began hopefully. For a moment, there was no answer. Then the minister looked up with a start. What? Oh, yes, it, it is a very nice day. And tisn't cold at all, either, even if tis October, observed Pollyanna, still more hopefully. Mr. Pendleton had a fire, but he said he didn't need it. It was just to look at. I like to look at fires, don't you? There was no reply this time, though Pollyanna waited patiently before she tried again, by a new route. Do you like being a minister? The Reverend Paul Ford looked up now very quickly. Do I like... 
Why, what an odd question. Why do you ask that, my dear? Nothing. Only the way you looked. It made me think of my father. He used to look like that. Sometimes. Did he? The minister's voice was polite, but his eyes had gone back to the dried leaf on the ground. Yes, and I used to ask him just as I did you if he was glad he was a minister. The man under the tree smiled a little sadly. Well, what did he say? Oh, he always said he was, of course. But most always he said, too, that he wouldn't stay a minister a minute if twasn't for the rejoicing texts. The what? The Reverend Paul Ford's eyes left the leaf and gazed wonderingly into Pollyanna's merry little face. Well, that's what Father used to call him, she laughed. Of course, the Bible didn't name him that, but it's all those that begin, Be glad in the Lord, or Rejoice greatly, or Shout for joy, and all that, you know. Such a lot of them. Once, when Father felt specially bad, he counted them. There were eight hundred of them. Eight hundred? Yes, that told you to rejoice and be glad, you know. That's why Father named them the Rejoicing Texts. Oh. There was an odd look on the minister's face. His eyes had fallen to the words on the top paper in his hands. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And so your father liked those Rejoicing Texts, he murmured. Oh, yes nodded Pollyanna emphatically. He said he felt better right away that first day he thought to count him. He said if God took the trouble to tell us 800 times to be glad and rejoice, he must want us to do it, some. And Father felt ashamed that he hadn't done it more. After that, they got to be such a comfort to him, you know, when things went wrong. When the ladies' aiders got to fight, I mean, when they didn't agree about something, corrected Pollyanna hastily. Why, it was those texts, too, Father said, that made him think of the game. He began with me on the crutches, but he said twas the rejoicing texts that started him on it. And what game might that be? asked the minister about finding something and everything to be glad about, you know. As I said, he began with me on the crutches. And once more, Pollyanna told her story, this time to a man who listened with tender eyes and understanding ears. A little later, Pollyanna and the minister descended the hill, hand in hand. Pollyanna's face was radiant. Pollyanna loved to talk and she had been talking now for some time. There seemed to be so many, many things about the game, her father, and the old home life that the minister wanted to know. At the foot of the hill, their ways parted, and Pollyanna down one road and the minister down another walked on alone. In the Reverend Paul Ford's study that evening, the minister sat thinking. Near him on the desk lay a few loose sheets of paper, his sermon notes. Under the suspended pencil in his fingers lay other sheets of paper, blank, his sermon to be. But the minister was not thinking either of what he had written or of what he intended to write. In his imagination he was far away in a little western town with a missionary minister who was poor, sick, worried and almost alone in the world, but who was poring over the Bible to find how many times his Lord and Master had told him to rejoice and be glad. After a time, with a long sigh, the Reverend Paul Ford roused himself, came back from the far western town, and adjusted the sheets of paper under his hand. 
Matthew 23rd, 13 through 14 and 23. He wrote. Then, with a gesture of impatience, he dropped his pencil and pulled toward him a magazine left on the desk by his wife a few minutes before. Listlessly, his tired eyes turned from paragraph to paragraph until these words arrested him. A father one day said to his son, Tom, who he knew had refused to fill his mother's wood box that morning, Tom, I'm sure you'll be glad to go and bring in some wood for your mother. And without a word, Tom went. Why? Just because his father showed so plainly that he expected him to do the right thing. Suppose he had said, Tom, I overheard what you said to your mother this morning, and I'm ashamed of you. Go at once and fill that wood box. I'll warrant that wood box would be empty yet, so far as Tom was concerned. On and on read the minister. A word here, a line there, a paragraph somewhere else. What men and women need is encouragement. Their natural resisting powers should be strengthened, not weakened. Instead of always harping on a man's faults, tell him of his virtues. Try to pull him out of his rut of bad habits. Hold up to him his better self, his real self that can dare and do and win out. The influence of a beautiful, helpful, hopeful character is contagious and may revolutionize a whole town. People radiate what is in their minds and in their hearts. If a man feels kindly and obliging, his neighbors will feel that way too before long. But if he scolds and scowls and criticizes, his neighbors will return scowl for scowl and add interest. When you look for the bad, expecting it, you will get it. When you know you will find the good, you will get that. Tell your son Tom you know he'll be glad to fill that wood box. Then watch him start, alert and interested. The minister dropped the paper and lifted his chin. In a moment he was on his feet, tramping the narrow room back and forth, back and forth. Later, some time later, he drew a long breath and dropped himself in the chair at his desk. God helping me, I'll do it, he cried softly. I'll tell all my Toms I know they'll be glad to fill that wood box. I'll give them work to do, and I'll make them so full of the very joy of doing it that they won't have time to look at their neighbors' wood boxes. And he picked up his sermon notes, tore straight through the sheets, and cast them from him, so that on one side of his chair lay, But woe unto you, and on the other, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, while across the smooth white paper before him his pencil fairly flew, after first drawing one black line through Matthew 23rd, 13 through 14, and 23. Thus it happened that the Reverend Paul Ford's sermon the next Sunday was a veritable bugle call to the best that was in every man and woman and child that heard it and its text was one of Pollyanna's shining 800. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. End of chapter 22。Chapter 23 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by the Story Girl. Chapter 23. An Accident. At Mrs. Snow's request, Pollyanna went one day to Dr. Chilton's office to get the name of a medicine which Mrs. Snow had forgotten. As it chanced, Pollyanna had never before seen the inside of Dr. Chilton's office. I've never
never been to your home before. This is your home, isn't it? she said, looking interestedly about her. The doctor smiled a little sadly. Yes, such as tis, he answered, as he wrote something on the pad of paper in his hand. But it's a pretty poor apology for a home, Pollyanna. They're just rooms, that's all. Not a home. Pollyanna nodded her head wisely. Her eyes glowed with sympathetic understanding. I know. It takes a woman's hand and heart, or a child's presence, to make a home, she said. Eh? Hey? The doctor wheeled about abruptly. Mr. Pendleton told me nodded Pollyanna again. About the woman's hand and heart, or the child's presence, you know? Why don't you get a woman's hand and heart, Dr. Chilton? Or maybe you'd take Jimmy Bean, if Mr. Pendleton doesn't want him. Dr. Chilton laughed a little constrainedly. So Mr. Pendleton says it takes a woman's hand and heart to make a home, does he? He asked evasively. Yes, he says his is just a house, too. Why don't you, Dr. Chilton? Why don't I... what? The doctor had turned back to his desk. Get a woman's hand and heart. Oh, and I forgot. Pollyanna's face showed suddenly a painful color. I suppose I ought to tell you. It wasn't Aunt Polly that Mr. Pendleton loved long ago, and so we... We aren't going there to live. You see, I told you it was, but I made a mistake. I hope you didn't tell anyone, she finished anxiously. No, I didn't tell anyone, Pollyanna, replied the doctor a little queerly. Oh, that's all right then, sighed Pollyanna in relief. You see, you're the only one I told, and... I thought Mr. Pendleton looked sort of funny when I said I'd told you. <laughs> Did he? The doctor's lips twitched. Yes, and of course he wouldn't want many people to know it, when twasn't true. But why don't you get a woman's hand and heart, Dr. Chilton? There was a moment's silence. Then, very gravely, the doctor said, they're not always to be had, for the asking, little girl. Pollyanna frowned thoughtfully. But I should think you could get them, she argued. The flattering emphasis was unmistakable. Thank you, laughed the doctor with uplifted eyebrows. Then, gravely again, I'm afraid some of your older sisters would not be quite so confident. At least they they haven't shown themselves to be so obliging, he observed. Pollyanna frowned again. Then her eyes widened in surprise. Why, Dr. Chilton, you don't mean... You didn't try to get somebody's hand and heart once, like Mr. Pendleton, and, and couldn't, did you? The doctor got to his feet a little abruptly. There, there, Pollyanna. Never mind about that now. Don't let other people's troubles worry your little head. Suppose you run back now to Mrs. Snow. I've written down the name of the medicine and the directions how she is to take it. Was there anything else? Pollyanna shook her head. No, sir. Thank you, sir, she murmured soberly as she turned toward the door. From the little hallway, she called back, her face suddenly alight. Anyhow, I'm glad twasn't my mother's hand and heart that you wanted and couldn't get, Dr. Chilton. Goodbye. It was on the last day of October that the accident occurred. Pollyanna, hurrying home from school, crossed the road at an apparently safe distance in front of a swiftly approaching motor car. Just what happened, no one could seem to tell afterward. Neither was there any one found who could tell why it happened, or who was to blame that it did happen. 
Pollyanna, however, at five o'clock, was born, limp and unconscious, into the little room that was so dear to her. There, by a white-faced Aunt Polly and a weeping Nancy, she was undressed tenderly and put to bed. While from the village, hastily summoned by telephone, Dr. Warren was hurrying as fast as another motor car could bring him. And you didn't need to more and look at her aunt's face. Nancy was sobbing to old Tom in the garden after the doctor had arrived and was closeted in the hushed room. You didn't need to more and look at her aunt's face to see the twan no duty that was eating her. Your hands don't shake and your eyes don't look as if you were trying to hold back the angel of death himself when you're just doing your duty, Mr. Tom. They don't, they don't. Is she hurt? Bad. The old man's voice shook. There ain't no telling, sobbed Nancy. She lay back that white and still she might easy be dead. But Miss Polly said she wasn't dead, and Miss Polly had ought to know if anyone would. She kept up such a listening and a feeling for her heartbeats and her breath. Couldn't you tell anything what it done to her? That... That old Tom's face worked convulsively. Nancy's lips relaxed a little. I wish you would call it something, Mr. Tom, and something good and strong, too. Drat it! To think of its running down our little girl. I always hated the evil smelling things, anyhow. I did, I did. But where is she hurt? I don't know, I don't know, moaned Nancy. There's a little cut on her blessed head, but ain't bad. That ain't, Miss Polly says. She says she's afraid it's infernally she's hurt. A faint flicker came into old Tom's eyes. I guess you mean internally, Nancy, he said dryly. She's hurt infernally, all right. Plague take that automobile. But I don't guess Miss Polly'd be using that word all the same. Eh? Hey? Well, I don't know. I don't know, moaned Nancy with a shake of her head as she turned away. Seems as if I just couldn't stand it till that doctor gets out of there. I wish I had a washing to do. The biggest washing I ever see, I do, I do, she wailed wringing her hands helplessly. Even after the doctor was gone, however, there seemed to be little that Nancy could tell Mr. Tom. There appeared to be no bones broken, and the cut was of slight consequence. But the doctor had looked very grave, had shaken his head slowly, and had said that time alone could tell. After he had gone, Miss Polly had shown a face even whiter and more drawn-looking than before. The patient had not fully recovered consciousness, but at present she seemed to be resting as comfortably as could be expected. A trained nurse had been sent for and would come that night. That was all. And Nancy turned sobbingly and went back to her kitchen. It was some time during the next forenoon that Pollyanna opened conscious eyes and realized where she was. Why, Aunt Polly, what's the matter? Isn't it daytime? Why don't I get up? She cried. Why, Aunt Polly, I can't get up, she moaned falling back on the pillow after an ineffectual attempt to lift herself. No, dear, I wouldn't try that just yet, soothed her aunt quickly, but very quietly. But what is the matter? Why can't I get up? Miss Polly's eyes asked an agonized question of the white-capped young woman standing in the window, out of the range of Pollyanna's eyes. The young woman nodded. Tell her, the lips said. Miss Polly cleared her throat, 
and tried to swallow the lump that would scarcely let her speak. You were hurt, dear, by the automobile last night. But never mind that now. Andy wants you to rest and to go to sleep again. Hurt? Oh, yes. I... I ran. Pollyanna's eyes were dazed. She lifted her hand to her forehead. Why, it's done up, and it hurts. Yes, dear, but never mind. Just, just rest. But Aunt Polly, I feel so funny. It's so bad. My legs feel so, so queer. Only they don't feel at all. With an imploring look into the nurse's face, Miss Polly struggled to her feet and turned away. The nurse came forward quickly. Suppose you let me talk to you now, she began cheerily. I'm sure I think it's high time we were getting acquainted, and I'm going to introduce myself. I am Miss Hunt, and I've come to help your aunt take care of you. And the very first thing I'm going to do is to ask you to swallow these little white pills for me. Pollyanna's eyes grew a bit wild. But I don't want to be taken care of. That is, not for long. I want to get up. You know I go to school. Can't I go to school tomorrow? From the window where Aunt Polly stood now, there came a half-stifled cry. Tomorrow? smiled the nurse brightly. Well, I may not let you out quite so soon as that, Miss Pollyanna. But just swallow these little pills for me, please, and we'll see what they'll do. All right, agreed Pollyanna, somewhat doubtfully. But I must go to school day after tomorrow. There are examinations then, you know. She spoke again a minute later. She spoke of school, and of the automobile, and of how her head ached, but very soon her voice trailed into silence under the blessed influence of the little white pills she had swallowed. End of chapter 23 Read by the Story Girl Chapter 24 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by The Story Girl. Chapter 24 John Pendleton. Pollyanna did not go to school tomorrow, nor the day after tomorrow. Pollyanna, however, did not realize this, except momentarily when a brief period of full consciousness sent insisting questions to her lips. Pollyanna did not realize anything, in fact, very clearly, until a week had passed. Then the fever subsided, the pain lessened somewhat, and her mind awoke to full consciousness. She had then to be told all over again what had occurred. "'And so it's hurt that I am, and not sick,' she sighed at last. "'Well, I'm glad of that.' G "'Glad, Pollyanna?' asked her aunt, who was sitting by the bed. "'Yes. I'd so much rather have broken legs like Mr. Pendleton's than lifelong invalids like Mrs. Snow, you know. Broken legs get well.' and lifelong invalids don't. Miss Polly, who had said nothing whatever about broken legs, got suddenly to her feet and walked to the little dressing table across the room. She was picking up one object after another now, and putting each down in an aimless fashion quite unlike her usual decisiveness. Her face was not aimless-looking at all, however. It was white and drawn. 
On the bed, Pollyanna lay blinking at the dancing band of colors on the ceiling, which came from one of the prisms in the window. "'I'm glad it isn't smallpox that ails me, too,' she murmured contentedly. "'That would be worse than freckles. "'And I'm glad tisn't whooping cough. "'I've had that, and it's horrid. "'And I'm glad tisn't appendicitis, nor measles, "'cause they're catching. "'Measles are, I mean. "'And they wouldn't let you stay here. "'You seem to... "'to be glad for a good many things, my dear,' "'faltered Aunt Polly, "'putting her hand to her throat as if her collar bound.' Pollyanna laughed softly. "'I am. I've been thinking of em. Lots of em. All the time I've been looking up at that rainbow. I love rainbows. I'm so glad Mr. Pendleton gave me those prisms. I'm glad of some things I haven't said yet. I don't know, but I'm most glad I was hurt. Pollyanna!' Pollyanna laughed softly again. She turned luminous eyes on her aunt. "'Well, you see, since I have been hurt, you've called me dear lots of times, and you didn't before. I love to be called dear. By folks that belong to you, I mean. Some of the ladies' aiders did call me that, and of course that was pretty nice. But not so nice as if they had belonged to me, like you do.' Oh, Aunt Polly, I'm so glad you belong to me. Aunt Polly did not answer. Her hand was at her throat again. Her eyes were full of tears. She had turned away and was hurrying from the room through the door by which the nurse had just entered. It was that afternoon that Nancy ran out to old Tom, who was cleaning harnesses in the barn. Her eyes were wild. "'Mr. Tom! Mr. Tom! Guess what's happened!' she panted. "'You couldn't guess in a thousand years! You couldn't! You couldn't!' "'Then I calculate I won't try,' retorted the man grimly. "'Especially as I ain't got more'n ten to live anyhow, probably. You'd better tell me first off, Nancy.' "'Well, listen, then!' Who do you suppose is in the parlor now with the mistress? Who, I say? Old Tom shook his head. There's no telling, he declared. Yes, there is. I'm telling. It's John Pendleton. Sure now. You're joking, girl. Not much I am, and me a-letting him in myself, crutches and all. And the team he come in, a-waitin' this minute at the door for him, just as if he want the cranky old crosspatch he is, would never talks to no one. Just think, Mr. Tom. Him a-callin' on her. Well, why not? demanded the old man a little aggressively. Nancy gave him a scornful glance. As if you didn't know better than me, she derided. Eh? Oh, you needn't be so innocent, she retorted with mock indignation. You what led me wild goose chasing in the first place. What do you mean? Nancy glanced through the open barn door toward the house and came a step nearer to the old man. Listen, twas you that was telling me Miss Polly had a lover in the first place, wasn't it? Well, one day I thinks I finds two and two, and I puts them together and makes four. But it turns out to be five, and no four at all at all. With a gesture of indifference, old Tom turned and fell to work. If you're going to talk to me, you've got to talk plain horse sense, he declared testily. I never was no hand for figures. Nancy laughed. Well... It's this, she explained. I heard something that made me think him and Miss Polly was lovers. Mr. Pendleton? Old Tom straightened up. Yes, 
Oh, I know now. He wasn't. It was that blessed child's mother he was in love with. And that's why he wanted... But never mind that part, she added hastily, remembering just in time her promise to Pollyanna not to tell that Mr. Pendleton had wished her to come and live with him. Well, I've been asking folks about him some since, and I found out that him and Miss Polly hain't been friends for years, and that she's been hating him like poison, owing to the silly gossip that coupled their names together when she was eighteen or twenty. Yes, I remember, nodded old Tom. It was three or four years after Miss Jenny gave him the mitten and went off with the other chap. Miss Polly knew about it, of course, and was sorry for him, so she tried to be nice to him. Maybe she overdid it a little. She hated that minister chap, so it took off with her sister. At any rate, somebody begun to make trouble. They said she was running after him. Running after any man? Her? interjected Nancy. I know it, but they did, declared old Tom. And of course no gal of any spunkle stand that. Then about that time come her own lover and the trouble with him. After that she shut up like an oyster, and wouldn't have nothing to do with nobody for a spell. Her heart just seemed to turn bitter at the core. Yes, I know. I've heard about that now rejoined Nancy. And that's why you could have knocked me down with a feather when I see him at the door. Him what she hain't spoke to for years. But I let him in and went and told her. What did she say? Old Tom held his breath suspended. Nothing. At first. She was so still, I thought she hadn't heard. And I was just going to say it over, when she speaks up quiet-like, tell Mr. Pendleton I will be down at once. And I come down and told him. Then I come out here and told you, finished Nancy, casting another backward glance toward the house. Oh, grunted old Tom, and fell to work again. In the ceremonious parlor of the Harrington homestead, Mr. John Pendleton did not have to wait long before a swift step warned him of Miss Polly's coming. As he attempted to rise, she made a gesture of remonstrance. She did not offer her hand, however, and her face was coldly reserved. "'I called to ask for Pollyanna,' he began at once, a little brusquely. "'Thank you. She is about the same, said Miss Polly. And that is, won't you tell me how she is? His voice was not quite steady this time. A quick spasm of pain crossed the woman's face. I can't. I wish I could. You mean you don't know? Yes. But the doctor. Dr. Warren himself seems at sea. He is in correspondence now with the New York specialist. They have arranged for a consultation at once. But what were her injuries that you do know? A slight cut on the head, one or two bruises, and and an injury to the spine, which has seemed to cause paralysis from the hips down. A low cry came from the man. There was a brief silence, then huskily he asked, And Pollyanna, how does she take it? She doesn't understand at all how things really are, and I can't tell her. She must know something. 
Miss Polly lifted her hand to the collar at her throat in the gesture that had become so common to her of late. Oh, yes. She knows she can't move. But she thinks her legs are broken. She says she's glad it's broken legs like yours, rather than lifelong invalids like Mrs. Snow's. Because broken legs get well, and the other doesn't. She talks like that all the time until it, it seems as if I should die. Through the blur of tears in his own eyes, the man saw the drawn face opposite, twisted with emotion. And voluntarily his thoughts went back to what Pollyanna had said when he had made his final plea for her presence. Oh, I couldn't leave Aunt Polly now. It was this thought that made him ask very gently, as soon as he could control his voice. I wonder if you know, Miss Harrington, how hard I tried to get Pollyanna to come and live with me. With you? Pollyanna? The man winced a little at the tone of her voice, but his own voice was still impersonally cool when he spoke again. Yes. I wanted to adopt her. Legally, you understand. Making her my heir, of course. The woman in the opposite chair relaxed a little. It came to her suddenly what a brilliant future it would have meant for Pollyanna, this adoption. And she wondered if Pollyanna were old enough and mercenary enough to be tempted by this man's money and position. I am very fond of Pollyanna, the man was continuing. I am fond of her both for her own sake and for her mother's. I stood ready to give Pollyanna the love that had been twenty-five years in storage. Love. Miss Polly remembered suddenly why she had taken this child in the first place. And with the recollection came the remembrance of Pollyanna's own words uttered that very morning. I love to be called dear by folks that belong to you. And it was this love-hungry little girl that had been offered the stored-up affection of twenty-five years. And she was old enough to be tempted by love. With a sinking heart, Miss Polly realized that. With a sinking heart, too, she realized something else. The dreariness of her own future now, without Pollyanna. Well, she said, and the man, recognizing the self-control that vibrated through the harshness of the tone, smiled sadly. She would not come, he answered. Why? She would not leave you. She said you had been so good to her. She wanted to stay with you. And she said she thought you wanted her to stay. He finished, as he pulled himself to his feet. He did not look toward Miss Polly. He turned his face resolutely toward the door. But instantly he heard a swift step at his side and found a shaking hand thrust toward him. When the specialist comes, and I know anything definite about Pollyanna, I will let you hear from me, said a trembling voice. Goodbye, and thank you for coming. Pollyanna will be pleased. End of Chapter 24 Read by the Story Girl.
Chapter Twenty Five of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by The Story Girl. Chapter Twenty Five A Waiting Game. On the day after John Pendleton's call at the Harrington homestead, Miss Polly set herself to the task of preparing Pollyanna for the visit of the specialist. Pollyanna, my dear, she began gently, we have decided that we want another doctor besides Dr. Warren to see you. Another one might tell us something new to do, to help you get well faster, you know. A joyous light came to Pollyanna's face. Dr. Chilton? Oh, Aunt Polly, I'd so love to have Dr. Chilton. I've wanted him all the time, but I was afraid you didn't, on account of his seeing you in the sun parlor that day, you know. So I didn't like to say anything. But I'm so glad you do want him. Aunt Polly's face had turned white, then red, then back to white again. But when she answered, she showed very plainly that she was trying to speak lightly and cheerfully. Oh, no, dear. It wasn't Dr. Chilton at all that I meant. It is a new doctor, a very famous doctor from New York, who, who knows a great deal about, about hurts like yours. Pollyanna's face fell. I don't believe he knows half so much as Dr. Chilton. Oh, yes, he does, I'm sure, dear. But it was Dr. Chilton who doctored Mr. Pendleton's broken leg, Aunt Polly. If, if you don't mind very much, I would like to have Dr. Chilton. Truly, I would. A distressed color suffused Miss Polly's face. For a moment, she did not speak at all. Then she said gently, though yet with a touch of her old stern decisiveness, but I do mind, Pollyanna. I mind very much. I would do anything, almost anything for you, my dear. But I, for reasons which I do not care to speak of now, I don't wish Dr. Chilton called in on, on this case. And believe me, he cannot know so much about, about your trouble as this great doctor does who will come from New York tomorrow. Pollyanna still looked unconvinced. But, Aunt Polly, if you loved Dr. Chilton— What, Pollyanna? Aunt Polly's voice was very sharp now. Her cheeks were very red, too. I say if you loved Dr. Chilton and didn't love the other one, sighed Pollyanna, Seems to me that would make some difference in the good he would do. And I love Dr. Chilton. The nurse entered the room at that moment, and Aunt Polly rose to her feet abruptly, a look of relief on her face. I am very sorry, Pollyanna, she said a little stiffly, but I'm afraid you'll have to let me be the judge this time. Besides, it's already arranged— the New York doctor is coming tomorrow. As it happened, however, the New York doctor did not come tomorrow. At the last moment, a telegram told of an unavoidable delay owing to the sudden illness of the specialist himself. This led Pollyanna into a renewed pleading for the substitution of Dr. Chilton, which would be so easy now, you know. But as before, Aunt Polly shook her head and said, No, dear, very decisively, yet with a still more anxious assurance that she would do anything, anything but that, to please her dear Pollyanna. As the days of waiting passed, one by one, it did indeed seem that Aunt Polly was doing everything but that that she could do to please her niece. I wouldn't have believed it. You couldn't have made me believe it, Nancy said to old Tom one morning. 
There don't seem to be a minute in the day that Miss Polly ain't just hanging round waiting to do something for that blessed lamb, if tain't more than to let in the cat. And her what wouldn't let fluff nor buff upstairs for love nor money a week ago. And now she lets em tumble all over the bed just cause it pleases Miss Pollyanna. And when she ain't doing nothing else, she's moving them little glass danglers round to different renders in the room so the sun'll make the rainbows dance, as that blessed child calls it. She's sent Timothy down to Cobb's greenhouse three times for fresh flowers, and that besides all the posies fetched in to her too. And the other day, if I didn't find her sitting for the bed with the nurse actually doing her hair, and Miss Pollyanna looking on and bossing from the bed, her eyes all shining and happy, and I declare to goodness if Miss Polly hain't worn her hair like that every day now, just to please that blessed child. Old Tom chuckled. Well, it strikes me Miss Polly herself ain't looking none the worse for wearing them mare curls round her forehead, he observed dryly. Course she ain't, retorted Nancy indignantly. She looks like folks now. She's actually almost careful now, Nancy, interrupted the old man with a slow grin. You know what you said when I told you she was handsome once. Nancy shrugged her shoulders. Oh, she ain't handsome, of course. But I will own up she don't look like the same woman. What with the ribbons and lace jiggers Miss Pollyanna makes her wear round her neck. I told you so, nodded the man. I told you she wa'n't old. Nancy laughed. Well, I'll own up she hain't got quite so good an imitation of it as she did have, for Miss Pollyanna come. Say, Mr. Tom, who was her lover? I hain't found that out yet. I hain't, I hain't. Hain't ye? asked the old man, with an odd look on his face. Well, I guess you won't then from me. Oh, Mr. Tom, come on now, wheedled the girl. You see, there ain't many folks here that I can ask. Maybe not, but there's one, anyhow, that ain't answering, grinned old Tom. Then abruptly, the light died from his eyes. How is she today, the little gal? Nancy shook her head. Her face, too, had sobered. Just the same, Mr. Tom. There ain't no special difference, as I can see. Or anybody, I guess. She just lays there and sleeps and talks some and tries to smile and be glad cause the sun sets or the moon rises or some other such thing till it's enough to make your heart break with aching. I know. It's the game. Bless her sweetheart nodded old Tom, blinking a little. She told you, then, too, about that air game? Oh, yes, she told me long ago. The old man hesitated, then went on, his lips twitching a little. I was growling one day cause I was so bent up and crooked, and what do you suppose the little thing said? I couldn't guess. I wouldn't think she could find anything about that to be glad about. She did. She said I could be glad, anyhow, that I didn't have to stoop so far to do my weedin', cause I was already bent part way over. Nancy gave a wistful laugh. Well, I ain't surprised after all. You might know she'd find something. We've been playing it, that game since almost the first, cause there wa'n't no one else she could play it with, though she did speak of her aunt. Miss Polly! Nancy chuckled. I guess you hain't got such an awful different opinion of the mistress than I have, she bridled. Old Tom stiffened. 
I was only thinking twould be some of a surprise to her, he explained with dignity. Well, yes, I guess twould be. Then, retorted Nancy, I ain't saying what twould be now. I'd believe anything of the mistress now, even that she'd take to playing it herself. But ain't the little gal told her? Ever? She's told everyone else, I guess. I'm hearing of it everywhere now since she was herded, said Tom. Well, she didn't tell Miss Polly, rejoined Nancy. Miss Pollyanna told me long ago that she couldn't tell her cause her aunt didn't like her to have her talk about her father. And twas her father's game, and she'd have to talk about him if she did tell it. So she never told her. Oh, I see. I see. The old man nodded his head slowly. They was always bitter against the minister chap. All of em. Cause he took Miss Jenny away from em. And Miss Polly, young as she was, couldn't never forgive him. She was that fond of Miss Jenny in them days. I see, I see. Twas a bad mess. He sighed as he turned away. Yes, twas, all round, all round, sighed Nancy in her turn as she went back to her kitchen. For no one were those days of waiting easy. The nurse tried to look cheerful, but her eyes were troubled. The doctor was openly nervous and impatient. Miss Polly said little, but even the softening waves of hair about her face and the becoming laces at her throat could not hide the fact that she was growing thin and pale. As to Pollyanna, Pollyanna petted the dog, smoothed the cat's sleek head, admired the flowers and ate the fruits and jellies that were sent in to her, and returned innumerable cheery answers to the many messages of love and inquiry that were brought to her bedside. But she, too, grew pale and thin, and the nervous activity of the poor little hands and arms only emphasized the pitiful motionlessness of the once active little feet and legs, now lying so woefully quiet under the blankets. As to the game, Pollyanna told Nancy these days how glad she was going to be when she could go to school again, go to see Mrs. Snow, go to call on Mr. Pendleton, and go to ride with Dr. Chilton, nor did she seem to realize that all this gladness was in the future, not the present. Nancy, however, did realize it, and cry about it when she was alone. End of chapter 25 Read by The Story Girl Chapter 26 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by the Story Girl. Chapter 26 A Door Ajar. Just a week from the time Dr. Mead, the specialist, was first expected, he came. He was a tall, broad shouldered man with kind gray eyes and a cheerful smile. Pollyanna liked him at once, and told him so. "'You look quite a lot like my doctor, you see,' she added engagingly. "'Your doctor?' Dr. Mead glanced in evident surprise at Dr. Warren, talking with the nurse a few feet away. Dr. Warren was a small, brown-eyed man with a pointed brown beard. "'Oh, that isn't my doctor.' smiled Pollyanna, divining his thought. Dr. Warren is Aunt Polly's doctor. My doctor is Dr. Chilton. Oh, said Dr. Mead, a little oddly. 
his eyes resting on Miss Polly, who with a vivid blush had turned hastily away. Yes. Pollyanna hesitated, then continued with her usual truthfulness. You see, I wanted Dr. Chilton all the time, but Aunt Polly wanted you. She said you knew more than Dr. Chilton anyway about, about broken legs like mine. And of course, if you do, I can be glad for that. Do you? A swift something crossed the doctor's face that Pollyanna could not quite translate. Only time can tell that, little girl, he said gently. Then he turned a grave face toward Dr. Warren, who had just come to the bedside. Everyone said afterward that it was the cat that did it. Certainly, if Fluffy had not poked an insistent paw and nose against Pollyanna's unlatched door, the door would not have swung noiselessly open on its hinges until it stood perhaps a foot ajar, and if the door had not been open, Pollyanna would not have heard her aunt's words. In the hall, the two doctors, the nurse, and Miss Polly stood talking. In Pollyanna's room, Fluffy had just jumped to the bed with a little purring meow of joy, when through the open door sounded clearly and sharply Aunt Polly's agonized exclamation. Not that! Doctor, not that! You don't mean the child will never walk again? It was all confusion then. First, from the bedroom, came Pollyanna's terrified, Aunt Polly? Aunt Polly? Then, Miss Polly, seeing the open door and realizing that her words had been heard, gave a low little moan, and, for the first time in her life, fainted dead away. The nurse, with a choking, She hurt? stumbled toward the open door. The two doctors stayed with Miss Polly. Dr. Mead had to stay. He had caught Miss Polly as she fell. Dr. Warren stood by helplessly. It was not until Pollyanna cried out again sharply and the nurse closed the door that the two men, with a despairing glance into each other's eyes, awoke to the immediate duty of bringing the woman in Dr. Mead's arms back to unhappy consciousness. In Pollyanna's room, the nurse had found a purring gray cat on the bed, vainly trying to attract the attention of a white-faced, wild-eyed little girl. "'Miss Hunt, please, I want Aunt Polly. I want her right away. Quick, please!' The nurse closed the door and came forward hurriedly. Her face was very pale. "'She... She can't come just this minute, dear. She will a little later. What is it? Can't I get it? Pollyanna shook her head. But I want to know what she said. Just now. Did you hear her? I want Aunt Polly. She said something. I want her to tell me tisn't true. Tisn't true. The nurse tried to speak, but no words came. Something in her face sent an added terror to Pollyanna's eyes. "'Miss Hunt, you did hear her. It is true. Oh, it isn't true. You don't mean I can't ever walk again?' "'There, there, dear. Don't, don't,' choked the nurse." Perhaps he didn't know. Perhaps he was mistaken. There's lots of things that could happen, you know. But Aunt Polly said he did know. She said he knew more than anybody else about... about broken legs like mine. Yes, yes, I know, dear. But all doctors make mistakes sometimes. Just... just don't think any more about it now. Please don't, dear. 
Pollyanna flung out her arms wildly. But I can't help thinking about it, she sobbed. It's all there is now to think about. Why, Miss Hunt, how am I going to school? Or to see Mr. Pendleton, or Mrs. Snow, or, or anybody? She caught her breath and sobbed wildly for a moment. Suddenly she stopped and looked up, a new terror in her eyes. Why, Miss Hunt, if I can't walk, how am I ever going to be glad for anything? Miss Hunt did not know the game, but she did know that her patient must be quieted, and that at once. In spite of her own perturbation and heartache, her hands had not been idle, and she stood now at the bedside with the quieting powder ready. "'There, there, dear. Just take this,' she soothed. "'And by and by we'll be more rested, and we'll see what can be done then. Things aren't half as bad as they seem, dear, lots of times, you know.' Obediently, Pollyanna took the medicine and sipped the water from the glass in Miss Hunt's hand. "'I know that sounds like things father used to say,' faltered Pollyanna, blinking off the tears. "'He said there was always something about everything that might be worse. "'But I reckon he'd never just heard he couldn't ever walk again. "'I don't see how there can be anything about that.' That could be worse. Do you? Miss Hunt did not reply. She could not trust herself to speak just then. End of chapter 26 Read by the Story Girl Chapter 27 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by The Story Girl Chapter 27 Two Visits It was Nancy who was sent to tell Mr. John Pendleton of Dr. Mead's verdict. Miss Polly had remembered her promise to let him have direct information from the house. To go herself or to write a letter she felt to be almost equally out of the question. It occurred to her then to send Nancy. There had been a time when Nancy would have rejoiced greatly at this extraordinary opportunity to see something of the house of mystery and its master. But today her heart was too heavy to rejoice at anything. She scarcely even looked about her at all, indeed, during the few minutes she waited for Mr. John Pendleton to appear. "'I'm Nancy, sir,' she said respectfully, in response to the surprised questioning of his eyes when he came into the room. "'Miss Harrington sent me to tell you about Miss Pollyanna.' "'Well?' In spite of the curt terseness of the word, Nancy quite understood the anxiety that lay behind that short, well. "'It ain't well, Mr. Pendleton,' she choked. "'You don't mean—' He paused, and she bowed her head miserably. "'Yes, sir. He says she can't walk again. Never.' For a moment there was absolute silence in the room— then the man spoke, in a voice shaken with emotion. Poor little girl. Poor little girl. Nancy glanced at him, but dropped her eyes at once. She had not supposed that sour, cross, stern John Pendleton could look like that. In a moment he spoke again still in the low, unsteady voice. "'It seems cruel. 
ever to dance in the sunshine again. My little prism girl. There was another silence. Then, abruptly, the man asked, She herself doesn't know yet, of course, does she? But she does, sir, sobbed Nancy. And that's what makes it all the harder. She found out. Drat that cat! I beg your pardon, apologized the girl hurriedly. It's only that the cat pushed open the door and Miss Pollyanna overheard him talking. She found out. That way. Poor little girl, sighed the man again. Yes, sir. You'd say so, sir, if you could see her, choked Nancy. I ain't seen her but twice since she knew about it, and it done me up both times. You see, it's all so fresh and new to her, and she keeps thinking all the time of new things she can't do now. It worries her, too, cause she can't seem to be glad. Maybe you don't know about her game, though broke off Nancy, apologetically. "'The glad game?' asked the man. "'Oh, yes, she told me of that.' "'Oh, she did. Well, I guess she has told it generally to most folks. But, you see, now she... she can't play it herself. And it worries her. She says she can't think of a thing not a thing about this not walking again to be glad about. Well, why should she? retorted the man almost savagely. Nancy shifted her feet uneasily. That's the way I felt, too, till I happened to think. It would be easier if she could find something, you know. So I tried to... to remind her. To remind her? Of what? John Pendleton's voice was still angrily impatient. Of, of how she told others to play it, Miss Snow and the rest, you know, and what she said for them to do. But the poor little lamb just cries and says it don't seem the same somehow. She says it's easy to tell lifelong invalids how to be glad, but taint the same thing when you're the lifelong invalid yourself and have to try to do it. She says she's told herself over and over again how glad she is that other folks ain't like her, but that all the time she's saying it, she ain't really thinking of anything, only how she can't ever walk again. Nancy paused, but the man did not speak. He sat with his hands over his eyes. Then I tried to remind her how she used to say the game was all the nicer to play when when it was hard, resumed Nancy in a dull voice. But she says that, too, is different, when it really is hard. And I must be going now, sir, she broke off abruptly. At the door, she hesitated, turned, and asked timidly, I couldn't be telling Miss Pollyanna that that you'd seen Jimmy Bean again, I suppose, sir, could I? I don't see how you could, as I haven't seen him, observed the man a little shortly. Why? Nothing, sir. Only, well, you see, that's one of the things that she was feeling bad about, that she couldn't take him to see you now. She said she'd taken him once, but she didn't think he showed off very well that day, and that she was afraid you didn't think he would make a very nice child's presence, after all. Maybe you know what she means by that? But I didn't, sir. Yes, I know what she means. All right, sir. It was only that she was wanting to take him again, she said, so's to show ye he really was a lovely child's presence. And now she can't drat that automobile. I beg your pardon, sir. 
Goodbye. And Nancy fled precipitately. It did not take long for the entire town of Beldingsville to learn that the great New York doctor had said Pollyanna Whittier would never walk again. And certainly never before had the town been so stirred. Everybody knew by sight now the piquant little freckled face that had always a smile of greeting. And almost everybody knew of the game that Pollyanna was playing. To think that now never again would that smiling face be seen on their streets, never again would that cheery little voice proclaim the gladness of some everyday experience. It seemed unbelievable, impossible, cruel. In kitchens and sitting rooms and over backyard fences women talked of it and wept openly. On street corners and in store lounging places the men talked too, and wept, though not so openly. And neither the talking nor the weeping grew less when fast on the heels of the news itself came Nancy's pitiful story that Pollyanna, face to face with what had come to her, was bemoaning most of all the fact that she could not play the game that she could not now be glad over anything. It was then that the same thought must have, in some way, come to Pollyanna's friends. At all events, almost at once, the mistress of the Harrington homestead, greatly to her surprise, began to receive calls. Calls from people she knew and people she did not know. Calls from men women and children, many of whom Miss Polly had not supposed that her niece knew at all. Some came in and sat down for a stiff five or ten minutes. Some stood awkwardly on the porch steps, fumbling with hats or handbags, according to their sex. Some brought a book, a bunch of flowers, or a dainty to tempt the palate. Some cried, frankly. Some turned their backs and blew their noses furiously, but all inquired very anxiously for the little injured girl, and all sent to her some message, and it was these messages which, after a time, stirred Miss Polly to action. First came Mr. John Pendleton. He came without his crutches today. I don't need to tell you how shocked I am he began almost harshly. But can nothing be done? Miss Polly gave a gesture of despair. Oh, we're doing, of course, all the time. Dr. Mead prescribed certain treatments and medicines that might help, and Dr. Warren is carrying them out to the letter, of course. But Dr. Mead held out almost no hope. John Pendleton rose abruptly, though he had but just come. His face was white, and his mouth was set into stern lines. Miss Polly, looking at him, knew very well why he felt that he could not stay longer in her presence. At the door he turned. "'I have a message for Pollyanna,' he said. Will you tell her, please, that I have seen Jimmy Bean and that he's going to be my boy hereafter? Tell her I thought she would be glad to know. I shall adopt him, probably. For a brief moment, Miss Polly lost her usual well-bred self-control. "'You will adopt Jimmy Bean,' she gasped. "'The man lifted his chin a little. "'Yes. "'I think Pollyanna will understand. "'You will tell her I thought she would be... glad.' "'Why, of... of course,' faltered Miss Polly. "'Thank you,' bowed John Pendleton as he turned to go. 
In the middle of the floor, Miss Polly stood, silent and amazed, still looking after the man who had just left her. Even yet she could scarcely believe what her ears had heard. John Pendleton? Adopt Jimmy Bean? John Pendleton? Wealthy, independent, morose, reputed to be miserly and supremely selfish, to adopt a little boy? And such a little boy! With a somewhat dazed face, Miss Polly went upstairs to Pollyanna's room. Pollyanna, I have a message for you from Mr. John Pendleton. He has just been here. He says to tell you he has taken Jimmy Bean for his little boy. He said he thought you'd be glad to know it. Pollyanna's wistful little face flamed into sudden joy. Glad? Glad? Well, I reckon I am glad. Oh, Aunt Polly, I've so wanted to find a place for Jimmy. And that's such a lovely place. Besides, I'm so glad for Mr. Pendleton, too. You see, now he'll have the child's presence. The what? Pollyanna colored painfully. She had forgotten that she had never told her aunt of Mr. Pendleton's desire to adopt her, and certainly she would not wish to tell her now that she had ever thought for a minute of leaving her. This dear Aunt Polly. The child's presence, stammered Pollyanna hastily. Mr. Pendleton told me once, you see, that only a woman's hand and heart or a child's presence could make a... a home. And now he's got it. The child's presence. Oh, I see said Miss Polly very gently. And she did see, more than Pollyanna realized. She saw something of the pressure that was probably brought to bear on Pollyanna herself at the time John Pendleton was asking her to be the child's presence, which was to transform his great pile of gray stone into a home. I see, she finished her eyes stinging with sudden tears. Pollyanna, fearful that her aunt might ask further embarrassing questions, hastened to lead the conversation away from the Pendleton house and its master. Dr. Chilton says so, too. Then it takes a woman's hand and heart or a child's presence to make a home, you know, she remarked. Miss Polly turned with a start. Dr. Chilton, how do you know that? He told me so. Twas when he said he lived in just rooms, you know, not a home. Miss Polly did not answer. Her eyes were out the window. So I asked him why he didn't get em, a woman's hand and heart, and have a home. Pollyanna. Miss Polly had turned sharply. Her cheeks showed a sudden color. Well, I did. He looked so... so sorrowful. What did he... say? Miss Polly asked the question, as if in spite of some force within her that was urging her not to ask it. He didn't say anything for a minute. Then he said very low that you couldn't always get em for the asking. There was a brief silence. Miss Polly's eyes had turned again to the window. Her cheeks were still unnaturally pink. Pollyanna sighed. He wants one anyhow, I know, and I wish he could have one. Why, Pollyanna, how do you know? Because afterwards, on another day, he said something else. He said that low, too, but I heard him. He said that he'd give all the world 
if he did have one woman's hand and heart. "'Why, Aunt Polly, what's the matter?' Aunt Polly had risen hurriedly and gone to the window. "'Nothing, dear. I was changing the position of this prison," said Aunt Polly, whose whole face now was aflame. End of chapter 27 Recording by The Story Girl